Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and thank you all uh, joining us in person. And also thank you very much to the ASBN team, uh, making sure things can go as uh, smoothly as possible. Um, we would like you to participate in a little bit of uh, cultural awareness for where we are from in, in, uh, here in Tandanya. So, Namarni. Great to have you all here. Thank you so much. And um, with that, I'd also like to acknowledge that today's event is held on Tandanya, which is the traditional lands of the Ghana people. And we pay our respects to Ghana's elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And the ASBN, we would like to always extend our deep respect and appreciation of all uh, indigenous cultures across uh, Australia and very much revere their custodianship of land. Um, Tandanya is currently more widely known as Adelaide, South Australia. So for any of you South Australians that are here, this is um, what it has been referred to for probably millennia. Um, and it was more recently known as Adelaide. Now, the traditional lands of the Ghana people extends toward the Adelaide Hills, where it, um, it borders on the uh, Pemerang uh, Nation. It also goes down to the Fleurial Peninsula, down south, bordering the lands of the Naranjiri, and up north toward the York Peninsula, which actually borders the traditional lands of the Naranga, uh, the Nukunu, and the Najiri people. Um, so once again, on behalf of the ASBN, and hopefully with the rest of the panel here. Um, uh, we do pay our respects to any of our indigenous communities uh, joining here us today live or on the Zoom. And also, of course, uh, around the world. Um, uh, because that, that ethic toward country, that ethic toward custodianship of land, um, is definitely a universal um, uh, understanding and approach, uh, not just in in Australia, but of course we do acknowledge that in Australia we do have the longest living culture. Um, and upon that uh, uh, acknowledgement of country, I'd also like to welcome all of you to here tonight again, um, because uh, we also acknowledge that we, we all here in person and virtually, can be custodians into the future. And we would like to actually invite all of you to maybe, even if it's a little bit, try to inherit a little bit of that ethic into how you uh, go about your lives. No pressure. Um, uh, before I go too far uh, into starting the event, I should also say who I am. Do you know who I am? No, exactly. Um, everyone on Zoom probably doesn't even know who I am. So my name is Ken Long. I happen to be the chair of the Adelaide Sustainable Building Network. Oh, mouthful, isn't it? Um, ASBN for short. And um, the, main, the main aspect of the ASBN is we've actually been working on this. We've, we're thinking about our vision, right? So our vision actually is to inspire built environments which regenerate people and planet. Now you'll also feel see a theme here because regenerate is also the key point of our conversation here today, and we hope we are able to expand on that uh, throughout the evening. Um, the, what we do is that we promote, we educate, and we connect people and organizations to empower South Australians uh, toward realizing sustainable and regenerative practices within the built environment. So that's kind of what we do. Um, we, uh, our, main, our main focus is just to engage all of you, fantastic people here tonight, um, around various concepts that we feel, and also with people, 
in South Australia that we feel are really important to actually progressing this conversation, this, um, not only this idea, but this reality that a regenerative future um, is possible. Um, and really, uh, the reason why we're always really excited about integrating the word regenerate now in terms of the lingo, right? Because language is very, very powerful. If you don't know what to describe, you don't know what to say, you actually don't know what kind of future you can aim for. So regenerative design, uh, regeneration is all about um, being, adding positively. So you're adding something to it, right? Um, a gentleman named Stephen Choi, um, who's a fantastic gentleman. He used to be the um, director of the Living Future Institute. Uh, one thing that I love that he always says is, if you ever, if someone asked you how your relationship was going and you said sustainable, whew, you shouldn't say that in front of your partner. Um, because really, sustainable, we, it's, an, it's, a very, it's a very needed concept. It's a very needed concept because we need to um, create a way that we are, we're not actually, we're negating our impact on our ecology, our environment, and also for the betterment of our human species. However, when we start talking about regenerative, regeneration, we're actually talking about with every single opportunity in the design of the built environment, design of policy for the built environment, um, design even the thinking toward the built environment, we're really thinking about how we can actually um, integrate the needs of society and integrate the needs of nature and positively impact that. So. Um, this idea of positive impact is something that we really want to strike home and really want to be part of our future discussions uh, with, the, with the ASBN as we continue to mature. Uh, now, one thing that you'll probably be asking us is uh, regenerative design. Um, you've probably heard, heard this in many different facets before. So uh, you've probably heard of things like biomimicry, uh, uh, biophilic design connection with nature, ecological economics, um, circular economies. Um, all those things actually encompass what regeneration actually is. So if we can actually, um, if you've heard any of those kind of bits and pieces, it's more about like, OK, how do we make sure that we have all these different ideas um, really come under a, a, another banner to that? So um, I'm pretty sure we'll get further into that and those kind of bits and pieces as well. Now, our event today is um, guided mainly in a two-part discussion. So I have about, I have two, two questions that the panel will answer at different, well, one at the beginning and one way mid through. Um, as told to the panel, this is really meant to make sure that our conversation is on the right tracks or we're talking about exactly what I want to talk about. I'm the MC. I get to take control of things. I'm just kidding. No, it's, it's a lot more democratic than that because um, after, we, after the panel, sort of we're talking about a question, and we're trying to get a little bit of feedback so we know how y'all think and you know, what kind of value at regenerative ideas you can bring to the table. Um, we, we also want to make sure you all are involved. So, are you all ready to have some fun tonight? Yeah. Oh! That's what I'm talking about. Now, um, for those that uh, do things on the socials, um, hashtag the ASBN experience, hashtag regenerative futures, hashtag declare AU. Or you can just tag us, and then we'll try to you know, share your stuff. Make us go viral soon. You're already on the internet. Help us out. Be part of the change. Um, uh, but before we get stuck into the conversation, of course, you need to know who you're talking to. Yes? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, of course you do. Because these fantastic people, not only are they brilliant people and South Australian champions, um, they, uh, uh, they are willingly coming here to engage with you guys on different ideas and conversations. Now, um, so just quick introduction of them all um, in no order. Uh, specifically, um, we have Craig Lover Lovery, um, who is a landscape architect and director at Clover Greenspace. 
Now, Craig, is, um, Craig has over 20 years' experience in private practice, as well as within local government, and he used to work for the city of Adelaide. Um, but he, all, he decided to start Clover Green Space three, three and a half years ago, um, mainly working on Main Street upgrades, uh, parks and open play spaces, um, defense, as well as making sure that um, South Australia has a green infrastructure specialist. Um, so if you've seen almost any of the green walls, facades, or potentially even like green roofs in South Australia, Craig has probably had a hand in them. So welcome, Craig. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, good work, good work. Um, and we have Craig number two. I did, I did do this on purpose. But um, this is Dr. Craig uh, Liddicote, um, who has uh, quite a few um, uh, areas of expertise. So I'm going to make sure that I call them all out, mainly so everyone knows how accomplished you are. Uh, so Craig, yeah, yeah, um, uh, research fellow in uh, res restoration geno gen genomics at Flinders Uni University, a senior natural resource management scientist at the Department of en uh, Environment and Water, DO, South Australia. And he's also an adjunct, adjunct senior fellow in the public School of Public Health at the University of Adelaide. So not only involved in some nice universities here, but also helping our government out, uh, get, make some sense of all these things. Um, however, uh, Craig's broad, uh, broad background, which also includes mechanical engineering and environmental science, um, he, he's been working um, a, a big chunk of his career is working in the environmental sector. And um, what's really interesting is that uh, in 2019, Craig uh, Craig completed a PhD in bioscience, which investigated connections between healthy environments and healthy people, um, specifically around exposure to microbially diverse plants and soils, uh, which can help recharge um, our own protective microbiome, uh, immune fitness, and also mental health. So this is the intersection, the, the interdisciplinary kind of component of uh, creating more regenerative futures because we have to acknowledge that our, the health of our ecology is also inherent to the health of us. So thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Craig. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have Trish Hansen, who is the founding principal of Urban Mind Studio. And so Trish, um, uh, as a strategist and system designers in the field of health, well-being, arts, and culture, Lots of interdisciplinary kind of thought here, very much a connections person. Um, but through that, Trish works to enrich the creative and cultural life of places, neighborhoods, and cities. Um, Trish has done this through engaging arts and cultural strategy development and uh, with municipality, various municipalities, um, and has experience working also with like uh, not only local government and state government, but also the UN. Uh, currently also a Good Design Australia ambassador, Ooh, woo. Um, fellow of the Center of Conscious Design, um, the board director of the South Australian Living Artist, Sala, and also has um, served on other committees for Good Design Australia, like their COVID-19 task force. So welcome, Trish. Looking forward to uh, your inputs. <laughs> and we also have Echeni Tr Trindade. Did I get that right, Echeni? Yes. Yeah. Now, Echeni um, actually was a former ASPN committee member, so we're extremely pleased that people that helped us out in the past can also sit on the panel and give us some, drop some knowledge for us. Um, but uh, Echeni actually prefers to be called Echi. Yeah. Um, and Echi currently is an advisor within the asset standard environmental management uh, component of the Department of Education here in South Australia. She's actually been working in the construction sector since 18 years old, um, where she was working in an interior design company. Um, however, uh, she really wanted to progress a career in architecture. And, um, and in 2013, she was actually awarded a scholarship from the Brazilian government to come to UniSA to finish a uh, master's of uh, architecture. Now, um, uh, I, I really appreciate those days, because I actually met Echi first as a, as a student, um, doing some tutoring over at UniSA. Um, and uh, I think her exposure to sustainability has really fueled a passion for community-based um, uh, uh, solutions. 
and also to make sure that we create built environments that are not only environmentally friendly, but also focused toward human health and well-being. And that's what she's really trying to drive through um, her portfolio at the uh, uh, Department of Education. So welcome, Echi. And then last but not least, I've saved the longest uh, bio for last. <laughs> Phil Donaldson. No, look. Yeah, yep, 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 exactly. And, um, and because you have a graphic tee on. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm busting Phil's balls because um, we, go, we go a long way back. Um, Phil has always been one of those people in South Australia that has been championing su uh, sustainability um, and has always been a great supporter of the ASBN as well. So we're always really appreciative of uh, when you come to, um, to our events to be able to share your knowledge, your passion, and also your experience. Um, so currently, Phil is the executive leader of Bioregional Australia Foundation and is responsible for the delivery of the One Planet Living across Australia and the Oceanic region. Um, Phil also is the director of Sustain SA, which is a collaborative consultancy business uh, that works with other companies in order to bring the best people together to drive change, improve quality of life for people, and of course, prosperity for planet. And um, Phil has, uh, um, in terms of the way that he's been championing um, sustainability, it's not actually just um, his advocacy. It's actually, he's, he's worked within government. He's actually been um, on assessment panels for the Green Building Council, um, setting up living lab and research opportunities for many people. Um, he also happens to uh, be leading um, the All In, um, which is all about sort of like creating opportunities in Australia for uh, living labs. So ongoing, um, on the ground research that um, also makes sure, make sure that we have really good outcomes that can be used forward and hopefully also commercialized, correct? Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. Somewhat on there. Yeah, I don't always get the descriptions perfect, Phil. You did really well, Ken. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that won't be the last time. <laughs> um, so yeah, as you can see, we have, uh, we, we do want to make sure that we not only have a, a diverse range of, of people to be able to talk about um, ideas around sustainability and regeneration, but as you can see, um, almost everyone here on our panel actually embodies the thinking, like in terms of like even their career and their passion, it embodies a, um, an, uh, the type of thinking that we kind of need to make interdisciplinary connections to really be able to see or visualize how, how we are actually going to create a regenerative future. One, once again, that always looks to add, add positively. Um, to our ecology and human society. So, um, you guys ready to get into the fun bit? Yeah, y'all, I've, I've been talking too much, so are y'all ready to do the heavy li lifting? Yes. Are y'all ready to go for a ride in, in person and in Zoom? Oh! Raise it up, raise it up. Oh, yeah, I see y'all, I see y'all. <sighs> So to the panel, all right? So we're gonna, I wanna make sure that we bring in all of you on this particular question. Um, I know that all of you as individuals uh, within our community here in um, South Australia, Ghana land, um, you, you're not, you're here not to just think, uh, you're here to not only think beyond the status quo, to really push an agenda, uh, like a, a better outcomes, um, but also, you know, within doing that, it really helps us start to question, what is it to go beyond sustainability, right? Because like this idea of regeneration is, okay, we're getting a handle of sustainability now. Um, it was never the end goal. The end goal was always a more prosperous um, society, a more prosperous ecology, a more prosperous, like, and that intertwines with a more prosperous economy. So within your circle of influence, um, what do you feel a regenerative future entails and looks like? And if you don't mind, I would actually like to start off with Dr. Craig and also Trish, mainly because I know y'all are aware, uh, um, 
kind of you, you sit outside the area of the built environment, and especially from like uh, art, design, and public health, even policy, as well as um, especially like the eco ecological science that we should really be understanding more. I was wondering if we could bring you all in first, and then we'll get into those that have devoted quite a bit of time in the built environment, if that's all right. Please, Trish, start us okay. off. Hi, everyone. It's uh, good to um, be here and to present to you, and I'd also like to acknowledge um, our First Nations uh, friends all over the world from wherever people are joining us. Um, I'd like to start actually with an exercise in time. And we would have heard this maybe by uh, through Carl Sagan or Janine Benyus, the founder of Biomimicry, uh, where if we consider all of Earth's time in a 12-month, compressed into 12 months, where the 1st of January is 4.5 billion years ago, and the 31st of December at midnight is now. Where we find that on the 25th of February is when life first began 3.8 billion years ago. By 28th of March, we've got a primitive form of photosynthesis. By mid-July, we've got nucleus, a nucleus forming in cells, and those cells can then have sex by September. And we get this explosion of, of rich and complex life. So by early November, we've got fish and fungi and land plant, plants evolving. And by December, we've got insects and reptiles and early mammals. 13th of December, dinosaurs. 25th of December, 6 p.m., dinosaurs become extinct. 31st of December at lunchtime, 11.30 a.m., hominids walk. Apes stand up. 31st of December, last day of the year, at 11.36 p.m., 24 minutes to midnight, Homo sapiens. 11.59 p.m., one minute to midnight, is the end of the last ice age, the last 10,000 years, so the beginning of formalised agriculture as we know it, even though here in Australia we are learning more and more about practices all the time and how they extended pr prior to the uh, ice age. 11.59 p.m. and 58 seconds, two seconds to go, is the Industrial Revolution. So we've been at this destructive um, behaviour really for the last half a second, the last 50 years, but particularly the last 250 years, with this mindset, this heart set that has really shaped our relationship with nature rather than acknowledging that we are nature. So when we talk about ecology, we are it. And we do see our First Nations friends and colleagues uh, embodying that all around the world from the 5,000 language groups that, that uh, we know of. So in terms of um, regeneration, it's we're, we're better at regeneration than anything else. We've just got lost in the last half a second. We're also in this rite of passage. So when we think about what regeneration means, we don't know um, uh, what the next one second, the next 100 years will, will bring. We are in a genuine rite of passage where the outcome is unknown. And we, through our actions every day, are shaping that. And can you use the word custodians? We are the custodians. Whether we are custodians for a, a more positive future or for a, an extractionist uh, future. But we are the custodians. And uh, so I'm really eager for us to return to those principles of nature and those principles of First Nations uh, ways of, of, of knowing and being um, that have proven to be successful. So civilizations have flourished and failed mm. uh, for, for many thousands of years and uh, our First Nations uh, friends and colleagues um, are living proof that uh, humans can live sustainably, and when we do use the term sustainably in and then regeneration, um, sustainability is essentially just dying but more slowly, <laughs> um, whereas regeneration is restoring, repairing, rehabilitating, fixing what we've broken uh, and finding new ways of, of living and being that allow us to uh, live uh, harmoniously yep. on, this, on this planet. And like you said, if... Um if uh, this was all happening, uh, not only naturally, but also with other past civilizations, then we should be able to make policies that actually enact this um, sort of regenerative 
not only uh, I really appreciate what you were saying, Trish, is that um, a a almost like we have to reset the heart because at the end of the day we kind of know what's happening, but we actually do need to need to reset um, our values and heart and mind to it. Um, and I'd actually like to go from there right to uh, to yourself, um, Craig, and because a lot of that knowledge that Trish was probably even talking about is actually probably embedded in a lot of our natural systems. So in a lot of ways, we actually think um, natural systems are, uh, what's the right terminology here? It's like a lot of people will, will think of soil and trees and ecology as like if there's no humans there, it's lifeless. But in actuality, it's not. There's a lot of really important information out there. So through your, like, through your research and then also through your um, uh, you know, guiding decision making, also potentially in, in government sectors. You know, what are important aspects around understanding our ecology that can really help and actually speak to creating a much more um, healthy ecology and human society? Definitely, some themes I will reinforce there. So, part of being part of nature, the ecological sort of connection that we don't really appreciate. Um, yeah, so getting back to the definition of. Um, regeneration or regenerative. Um, I've spent a lot of time working in the environmental sustainable land management sort of area and regenerative farming is a term I guess that's sort of coming along now and, and at work we've kind of like struggled because it hasn't been well defined but sort of thinking about it before coming here t tonight I, I think of uh, the term regenerative as um, like a property of a, a system however big that system is to basically keep renewing itself so not, not keep on growing, but, but have a system that can keep renewing itself like a cycle of life. Mm. And there's very much a biological theme to that. And, and I'd like to sort of speak to that sort of biological aspect because, um, yeah, a connection between um, the environment and a healthy environment um, and healthy people. And I guess, um, you know, sustaining the sustainability side of it in terms of that connection between the environment that we choose to surround ourselves with and our health the situation at the moment is, is not really sustainable. It's, it's not sustaining. It's kind of going backwards. Um, generally speaking, I mean, we have some really nice environments here in Adelaide, but, but generally, um, you know, global populations are becoming more and more urbanised. It's something like 60 to 70% of people will be in urban areas mm -hmm. in the next decade or so. Um, and we're sort of seeing this, this rapid uh, rise in, in allergic, autoimmune and chronic inflammatory diseases where, where people... Um, uh, and, and a sort of growing number of, of immunologists and medical researchers are basically saying that, that that's likely partly at least due to um, our loss of connection with the natural world, mm. loss of exposure to microbial diversity. So the, the diversity of microbes and, um, and also perhaps key species. Um, so, you know, bacteria, viruses, fungi, uh, most of which are harmless or beneficial. You know, there's a few, a few bugs behaving badly that... that that get a lot of the, um, the spotlight. So yeah, um, basically, and and if we can, um, you know, consider ourselves part of nature, and and that we are exposed, th there's actually a, a tangible biological connection between our surroundings, and you know, plants, soils are, are very much a, a hidden, unappreciated thing, mm. but that's kind of where the 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 vast majority of microbial diversity and richness is in the environments, in, in the soils. That stuff can get airborne. Um, you know, we're breathing it in right now. We're breathing in an aerobiome right now that's, you know, getting on our skin, in our nose, in our airway. This stuff actually gets into our gut. And we kind of know um, medical science is sort of teaching us that our, our gut is... And we all know, you know, you should eat properly, right? Everyone knows that. So diet is key. But the microbes that kind of work with that diet are a big part of it as well. And microbes, um, our, our own microbiome, you know, our skin, airway, gut microbiome can actually be influenced by the environmental microbiome. Yeah. So microbes from the environment can come in and add to our protective, you know, diversity of microbes on, in our, on our own microbiome that, that's got a protective factor. Um, it helps build immune memory through antibodies. Um, microbes can come in and they have molecular patterns that basically trigger uh, immune signaling um, reactions and the gut is sort of a central place for that to happen. So, so bacteria, microbes, whatever can come in, trigger immune um, pathways and it's important for kids to get wired correctly. Their immune yeah. systems become wired. Uh, that's a critical thing when, when they're young. You know, and uh, 
dog wives tales, you know, we kind of knew this. We've known this stuff for a while, but the science is just basically just really yeah. this and, so. and that's the bits that becomes really, really interesting because um, it almost creates an onus, right? So um, in regards to, like, public health, um, this is actually like the also this in the developing science showcases that um, we can't actually have places devoid of nature. So, um, what I think is extremely um, uh, invigorating, and trust me, we, we could actually probably take in the rest of the panel off after you actually just said that because I like, could tell me more. Um, but uh, it also creates a, a big um, imperative that our built environments actually include opportunities to not only like so like biophilic design it's, it talks about exposure to nature that it's like you need that stimuli however what you're saying is that really it actually it's part like the, our DNA and our gut is actually dependent on a very healthy natural environment that's really close to us a couple of things like your gut is actually dominated by what they call spore forming bacteria and that kind of sounds a bit gross and you know, spores ooh, <laughs> that kind of means that these bacteria that it's an anaerobic environment in there, things come and go obviously, and so these bacteria spend time on the outside, they form a, a hard casing so they can survive out of the environment, but it kind of means that things come and go between the environment, there's this huge mm. exchange. And on that, just quickly on that immune signaling stuff, that can signal both um, inflammation, which is kind of defense or attack against pathogens, oh, yeah. it also triggers tolerance and, and basically anti-inflammatory responses. So, and there's other mechanisms music, mechanisms about, um, that relate to mental health, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. Thank you so much, um, and and fa and it's extremely fascinating uh, about that. And I think that's the reason why, um, uh, especially those in the built environment, we need to understand things around like policy, and then also um, uh, ways that people live, what inspires them, the science behind things. Because uh, I'll be honest, I'm from an architecture background. I work as a sustainability consultant, but you know, you get too bogged down in the engineering and you know structure of things, and then sometimes. You know, it's like, wait, 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 wait. We actually, oh, we can keep the structure up and then make sure that we have all the standards for that, but we actually don't even think about how do we integrate the landscape. Um, and that's where I want to go to you yourself, Craig. Um, because as, as a landscape architect, you also do urban planning, um, green infrastructure specialist. Uh, I have to say, there's a lot of, lot of uh, pressure on you to come with the goods and make sure that we're, we're getting uh, exposure to to the microbiome, like soils and plants, and to be able to get that good in microbiome inter, uh, interchange. Okay, uh, look, I'm, yeah, I used to work at the City of Adelaide, and um, when you're working in in government roles, you get a lot more time to to work on strategic projects and plan things and look at the big picture. And we did a lot of urban greening projects and. Uh, canopy analysis over the city and, and uh, where are the hot spots and where do we need to plant trees and then trying to rev the system up to make those things happen in a meaningful time frame and do them in the right way and within big organisations that's a really hard thing to do when there's things are set in place. Um, but th about three and a half years ago we moved out of the city and we actually moved to the country and we're about 50 k's out and we're in a really rural environment now and uh, I set up my business in in the hills and we now work in a rural place so um, I and there's lots of smart people on this panel smarter than me I'd actually look up regenerative futures and kind of try to tap into what that means and I think it's in a city context it means one thing but in a country context it means a totally different thing and when we get on to the case studies next I'd love to talk about the Cudley Creek fires which burned our property and the impact that that had on farmers, on winemakers, on the person you met down the road that has a shop there. And uh, we moved there, we were very, very green and it, in, a, in a naive sense and um, have set up and we've, we've met the people. Um, if you live in the hills, you either commute to an employment centre where you come to town or... or you go even more rural, or you have your business, you have your farm, you have your winery, you have your shop, you have your pub, you have your restaurant. So everybody is doing this to sustain that life and live that lifestyle, and they may have grown up there. And when a fire takes out the land and takes out the feed that feeds a farmer's sheep or cattle, 
uh, their crop, um, destroys their next harvest for their vineyard, that then affects the next person down the line that is employed by that person. And when that farmer can't earn income for nine months or 12 months because they have to build new fences, they have to re-establish their crops, they have to heal the land, but in a different sense to planting trees hmm. in Gooja Street or something that we were doing before. And then you see how that impacts the livelihood, the mental health of these people. So my wife has a shop in the main street and my business is there as well. So lots of people come in for a chat and uh, hearing stories of, of farmers that were stayed to try to fight that fire and uh, calling their significant others to say, I don't think I'm going to make it through this, but they did somehow. And seeing how that happened. So it gave the work that we've been doing in the hills, a lot in the hills, we still do a lot of work down here too, um, more meaning where working on a, a streetscape upgrade or a main street upgrade where that, that block has been untenanted for, for so long and the work that you do catalyzes someone to move in there and throw their life savings behind setting up a new cafe or a new shop in that main street, which then influences the person down the road that might have had a really rough year. And that's what country life is about. You, you have a, more of a personal contact and experience with these people. And that's why I wanted to go out on my own and start because I can make the call to invest more in that job Mm. rather than being ruled by a financial outcome or the or what the boss says and you you can follow through and you see the outcome you live there you you work there and you're in for the long haul and uh it's been a pretty eye-opening experience so yeah um oh sorry would you I'm done. No, no because um <laughs> no 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 because um i thought so um but the, the, that's an incredibly um, fantastic story, Craig, because I, I, I not only agree with what you're saying is that um, there, we, we, and what you're saying around context, because the context of urban areas will be very different from rural, the realities of how we live um, with each other, how we do we connect with each other, um, but how um, the, the natural environment and the built environment, the human-made environment, actually influences those kind of social connections, um, the resilience of a community um, to be able to get back on their feet. Um, because uh, there's a lot of things to think about, right? There's so many things to think about when you're thinking about uh, regenerative systems, circular systems, or you know, very mature ecosystems. All these different things are intertwined. And yes, it does make it daunting to really think about all those different kind of aspects. However, I think if we actually understand that regeneration is not just about actually positively impacting ecology, it's also making sure that we're making good desi design decisions to positively impact people um, and how that they can relate to each other. And of course, how they, can they relate and um, thrive also within a system that can also allow the, our own ecology to thrive. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for bringing those thoughts to the table and I really appreciate bringing that um, very personal element. Good stuff. Um, uh, and I, if, it, um, if it's okay, Etchi, I wanted to bring you in here because um, you know, working for the Department of Education, you know, you're going from, you're, you're understanding a lot of impact on society, but then um, the, of course the government with their, with their, um, with their funding, and these assets, we really need to really think about how are we positively impacting children. And Craig kind of uh, alluded to that. We need to make sure that our ecology is actually healthy because that also enables healthy uh, children, um, not only physically, but mentally as well. So um, how can the, these thoughts of regeneration also start to penetrate into uh, some of the projects that you're delivering? Um, thank you so much for all the topics. I think um, everything... Um, comes back to what I want to uh, touch as well. Um, because when we think about regenerative design and we think about how societies spend most of their time, we spend um, most of our time indoors. Unfortunately, would be um, 
would be amazing if we could um, spend less time indoors and more, ti more time outdoors. Um, but when we think about a space in an indoor uh, air quality, unfortunately, that's where we are absorbing most of these chemicals and components that's uh, inbuilt on the walls, carpet, um, chairs, and everything that um, uh, we absorb during the day. Uh, another aspect is most of the buildings we're not allowed to open the windows and allow some fresh air. So we are all the time breathing the air conditioning air through all day. So this affects a lot. And in my point of view, uh, generative design is a design that empower people and people could feel healthier and happy. So in our work, we're trying to um, do a lot of research and um, understand not just, not just natural light, biophilia, but also um, low VOCs and um, materials because, um, because of the aspect like working with children, mm -hmm. um, when their system is being developed like Craig, um, touched on the topic, it's the most important time when we need to be aware that this kind of um, materials and toxins that they absorb, in, especially at school, where they spend most of their time, um, could impact during their um, whole life, not just while they're children. So they could bring that um, and that can turn up in something more serious. So that's how we're trying to bring this topic and think about every day, especially not just the indoor quality, but um, natural light and other aspects, biophilia, how it could uh, help to improve um, this kind of, um, make it better, make buildings yeah, better, course. and yeah. people could be healthier as well. And especially working in a government department, that means, um, uh, you're actually trying to initiate sort of like long-term change as well. So, um, uh, you know, how has that experience been for you in terms of like w working within to actually change delivery methods or even potentially um, what's allowed to be put into designs and things like that? How, how have you seen that kind of change to think about a little bit more regenerative outcomes? Uh, for me, it's been an amazing opportunity because I, I actually always really enjoyed um, biophilia and work uh, with regenerative designs and sustainability. How sometimes, um, and uh, this allowed me to actually do a bit more research and be more engaged and discover more about um, these topics that are not uh, brought. Um, to society all the time, and sometimes we living with um, uh, uh, we live in an environment, and we have already so many things. Like you said, um, when you're designing and when you through a process, um, it's so many things involved. Sometimes you 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 um, get yourself so worried about a structure and the facade of the building that you get lost on the process. And it's so good to go back and rethink about um, all the things that's uh, very important for for the client for. For the kids. Um, for the kids. Yeah, the they user. are clients. So every time we are there and we are um, thinking about all the aspects and the standards and everything that's involved, we always think how the kids will be feeling on that space. So if they'll be happy, if they'll be engaged, if that space will help them to concentrate mm. and uh, everything that will help them with their learning. Yeah, fantastic. So thank you very much for the work and also the insight. Um, and then Phil, if I can bring you in here. Um, uh, like not only through your current role with Bioregional and things of that nature, but once again, um, you know, I always like to acknowledge the people that have really put in the hard yards uh, progressing this conversation around not like sustainability. And so we can actually have this conversation about regeneration and like the work that you've put in um, over uh, it, here in South Australia and other places, you know, you're part of those people that have allowed us to get to this point to actually talk about going beyond sustainability. So, um, 
Uh, how do you see regeneration really shaping the way that we approach the built environment going forward? Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, I think there's a, there's a big question around what it is to be human mm. and our relationship with each other and, and community. And when we start to think about um, the vision for what we want for our future, for our kids, then we can start to think about what does that mean for how I live and where I live and the interaction that I have not only with um, others but also in, in our neighbourhoods but also um, with nature. And I, I just want to reflect on an example right next to me about how humans uh, make decisions that um, because they can, because we're in a position of power um, and, and the environment isn't. And uh, I live at Lower Mitcham. Um, I was overseas at the time. I think I was either in, uh, uh, I think it was probably China, one of the, the um, uh, massive mega city worlds, uh, places in the world. Um, and I got a phone call from home and it was my partner and she rang up and she said, they're cutting the tree down. And I thought, well, okay. But they were cutting the tree down with a koala in it um, because they could. You know, the, the company um, didn't even know the koala was there to start with. Um, the next door neighbour obviously had permission. No, they didn't because the tree was on their land. They could cut it down. And I think that when we start talking about regeneration, we've got to start talking about what it means for us and the way that we live and the interaction that we have, not only for ourselves, but the environment in which, in which we find ourselves. Um, and so then when we start to think about what's our vision for that future in South Australia and in, in the built environment, um, we have to think about all, I mean, all the things that the panel have talked about are really critical and important. You can't just go we are going to build something because it's important for the economy and it's important for jobs. I mean, those jobs won't exist unless there's an environment there for those people to, to survive. And there's, there's um, theories out there now such as donut economics, which is starting to talk about if you don't have the environment, you don't have society and you don't have an economy. Um, and, that, and that is very true. And that's been around for a very long time in concept. It's now um, rising to the top as we start to talk about the sustainable development goals. So I think that that's one thing. The second thing is in terms of the way that we look at how do we make decisions. You know, so decisions are usually at the moment, and from a living lab perspective, we talk about a quadruple helix approach, where and, and I th I'm not sure who talked about empowerment. I think it was um, Etta talked about empowerment with kids. And you know, the one thing that um, when decisions are made, it's usually government, local government, and business. The people that are missed in the conversation are citizens or, in terms of the consultation, it's we'll come and consult, thank you for your advice, and now we'll go back into the little black box and we'll work out what the decision is. So when we talk about regenerative approaches, there are these changes, these massive systematic changes, not in terms of just um, the built environment and how we connect to nature and all the value that we get from nature. It comes down to the relationship that we have with the decisions that are made, you know, and, and again, I mean, I, and I didn't realise, just right next door to me, two doors down, someone brought a house, have subdivided it themselves without going planning approval, right, at the moment, because they can, so they put it, and they've already demolished the four trees that were in the backyard and the, and the, um, and the shed, and they can then go to, to council and go, I can subdivide, because there's nothing on that land, right? So these are the kind of things that, um, I struggle with, mm. live, just did live in, in the backyard. And then um, I've got, so part of this is around leadership. What's our leadership as, as in individuals and that, that connection with nature? And how far, what's the line in the sand? What mm. are we prepared to accept and what are we not prepared to accept? And I had a development, um, which will remain nameless, uh, that one of the principles of One Planet Living is zero carbon. So it's no fossil fuels. And this particular company wanted to, to, uh, uh, to have gas, mm. right, and said, can we still get the, the, uh, the accreditation, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I went back to the UK and I said, well, you know, can we, because it was a really important, it was a, potentially it's a transformational project. Um, so I was really keen to see where we could stretch. And the line in the sand was drawn, says, we don't really accept fossil fuel gas, mm. right? 
So, so part of that is around the leadership and the policy that we need. If we want to take that regenerative approach, some of it starts as you should have started ages ago. I mean, if I take Lock Hill Park as an example, um, you know, it was built in 2000 and started in 2006. It is, a, it is an example of the future. Mm. So the question is 10 years on, why haven't we got more of that future? Yep. And then we've got Buckland Park. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. and, and we have this hypocrisy between policy and process and decisions. Um, so when we talk about that regenerative future, I mean, I, mean, I think about Adelaide and I think about um, our regions, this unique opportunity for, you know, a state of villages, you know, and a state of thriving villages that, that actually believe in their hinterland and mm. their connection to nature that actually gets people to thrive and, and create that human capital that, that you know, and, and I really love Trisha's example of um, the, the period of time that we have, you know, we're down to the last half a second and then we've got First Nations people all around the world that have incredible knowledge. So one of the key things for me around this is around listening. Yeah. You know, if I can't listen, I can't change. And that, to me, is part of that regenerative Con, uh, consciousness, I think, mm. of where we need to go. Yeah, I'm not sure I answered your question. But. No, well, <laughs> that that's the beauty of uh, our sessions, is because we can take it wherever we want. But you all actually have answered that question. The question really was, you know, what does a regenerative future entail and look like? And you know, we talked about heart. We talked about policy. We talked about um, society. We talked about um, the actual built environments and facilitating that. We also talked about the, the environments that we actually need to be at the core of decision making of regeneration as well. Um, and uh, you know, for for all for all of us in in, in the audience, you know, I, I mean, I do hope this kind of like starts to once again starts to make you kind of reflect on a bit of things because. Um, once the, there's there's no silver bullet to this, and we all we always have to work um, uh, collaboratively uh, across all these different items because they're never going to be solved in isolation. And I think we've already brought that kind of stuff up. So um, because we don't want to be isolated to ourselves up here, I would like to actually open up to um, to questions. What I would like to ask is: we talk a lot a lot about urban areas and how crowded they have been over the years. And I believe that lots of research shows that it gets crowded in the cities due to work opportunities, which is where people tend to, to migrate to. What does COVID bring as an opportunity with uh, remote work becoming this huge trend and us being able to perform our jobs wherever we are? and if there's an opportunity there, what, uh, how could policies drive it further to actually create an impact in a more sustainable environments? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anybody, anyone want to take a crack at that? Uh, there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think um, being able to um, work in regional areas and still connect to, to city or globally around the world, um, fantastic. It will, will definitely um, be a credit. To, to helping the planet. Um, the policies, um, we can't just go out and do urban sprawl approaches to the way that we look at our, our regional areas. So we have to be really careful about that and we have to have those connections and those, I suppose, little enclaves of villages and parks. I mean, Adelaide is one of the um, most significant cities in the world for having a city in a park. You know, if we can create um, our new regions in parklands and new subdevelopments in parklands, then we, we're going to be better off. You know? But if we create an urban sprawl that goes back to what we know doesn't work, but we start to reduce our hinterland and our um, arable land that we need, um, then I think that's, that's the wrong way. I mean, there's a place called Cape Patterson in um, Victoria. It's a brilliant, brilliant development. Um, it's done by a private developer. Um, and they have, they have reshaped it in terms of standards of houses um, wetlands, um, gardens, play spaces, inviting the kangaroos as part of that process into the into the environment. So uh, we've got examples. It's just a matter of making sure that those examples go back because that will actually help that not only that you're in a region but you the mental health of connection. Yeah, but uh, kind of talking about because um, I think uh, Celeste 
thank, thank you for that question. It was talking about like an offer. So COVID, obviously, COVID-19, um, uh, globally, shitstorm. No ways, two ways about it. And however, where it's the same thing about um, bushfires, right? Like we don't want them to happen. However, when they do happen, it's an opportunity to learn. So with pain actually comes opportunities to learn. Is there actually learnings to be had in terms of like the built environment that we actually create? And yeah, Trisha, especially as part of a COVID task force, what, what, what is your thoughts about the built environment to it? Well, I think the built environment is um, a collection of successes and failures, isn't it? And so if we look at COVID as this uh, provocateur, if you like, and the symptom of meta failure, which um, arguably the bushfires are as well, and arguably um, uh, so the pandemic, uh, the the infection, we we are perfectly designed for a global pandemic. We're perfectly designed for another one. We're perfectly designed for 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 climate change. We've created it. So I think what it raises is what are the systems that are conducive to life, not just for our our built environment. Um, um, which is what we require as human beings, but also the planet. So I think this is the opportunity for us to really reset and to ask ourselves at any point, whether we work in tourism, policy, politics, education, law, health, um, anything, what is this in service to? The answer to that question will always be in service to extraction or in service to regeneration. And you can't have both. So I think that I've become obsessed with that question. What is it in service to? It's so simple. And I think when we do get to a point where we're asking our decision makers, what is this in service to? Uh, and it's overt, then we will be able to hold decision makers more accountable and really clearly uh, speak to our values. Yeah. Craig, do you mind if I bring you in? Because you, oh, sorry, Dr. Craig. My bad. <laughs> Dr. Craig. Do Dr. Craig. Um, <laughs> Y'all made it tricky for me. Nah, um, uh, I wouldn't say you're the, you're the only qualified scientist on the panel. You know, so um, especially, especially with like um, talking about how do we actually make more resilient people with our built environments with its exposure to natural environments and things of that nature. Um, how do you think that also intersects with because it is about public health and COVID. Yes, it is about proximity and then also transfer of viruses and stuff like that. I have very limited knowledge of this. However, from your perspective, if we, if we are designed to actually have a, uh, another pandemic, how do we actually create this as an opportunity to design ourselves out of that? Any thoughts? Yeah, I think we can definitely try and build our our immune fitness to these things, so um, both against infection and also building the sort of mental health resilience side of things. Um, I, I had the, a couple of case study type things. This is getting into the next area of discussion, but if, if no, if we, we'll, we'll, we can always go back and forth. Um, so, an example of um, building immune fitness, I guess, there was a, a, one of the better qualities of evidence sort of study that's out there. A Finnish uh, research team went to a child cares, uh, some child care centres, and they sort of kept some pretty standard, and some they introduced some um, sort of rain, they're probably you know, doing the wrong thing by the rainforest, but they scooped up some rainforest floor and popped it in these child care centres, and also some, some meadow sort of soil and grass and popped them in these child care centres. And, and after a period of time, the group of kids that were exposed to that had um, a higher diversity of a certain key group of, of good beneficial bacteria on their, their skin, in their airway. They had immune biomarkers in their blood that were also associated with lower, um, like an anti-inflammatory response. Mm. So that they were basically getting primed up for a fitter immune system by being exposed mm. to that stuff. Um, right. A second one, this is getting into the mental health resilience side of things. There's a bit of a story here. So um, in my PhD, um, we did this mouse study and it was kind of pretty ambitious because we didn't know if we were going to get an answer out of it, but we took soil from um, a bit of remnant native vegetation out there. So it's not just soil on its own, it's actually soil that's grown with 
biodiverse plants and yep. lots of root zone interactions and, and various things feeding lots of diversity. There's organic matter, there's clay content, there's, there's sort of rich diversity in those soils. We, we took them um, to the, uh, the lab and we basically had a uh, sort of replicated uh, experiment where we had lab mice in a little cage um, in a plastic enclosure, if you like. Mm. We had no soil, we had a low biodiversity soil, and we had a high biodiversity soil. So there's no sort of green pictures or leaves or anything. From the exposure of these lab mice to the high biodiversity soil, there was a, um, after we, it was like blowing dust. We are blowing dust for seven weeks on these mice. <laughs> so, you know, they're pretty... Did that pass ethics? Oh, no, no. This, okay. Our, our mice got off really lightly compared to what some people do. Um, I won't go there. So there were signs, and we did an um, anxiety-like behaviour test at the end of it. So that involves putting these mice in a box and you, you video track them, and if they hang out, more, if there's more time spent in the centre, then they're less anxious. If they hang in the corners or the sides, they're more anxious. So, and there was actually a, a, an, a, less ang a response of, of lowered anxiety in these mice that were, were exposed to the higher biodiversity soil dust Right, so and when we were digging into the the, you sort of look at the DNA and what's in there, and you try and work out what's in there, and there was a, a sign, and it's really just scratching the surface of this, but there was a sign that of a bacteria uh, from a soil that breaks down organic matter, and so you know if you think of what happens in your gut, you're breaking down organic matter if you're eating a diverse plant-based diet. So this stuff came from a soil, it uh, a biodiverse soil, it triggered in an anaerobic environment, it was a spore former. So getting back to that idea of things that can come from the environment actually might be at home in the soils or in our gut. So this thing, uh, when you looked at the most anxious mice, as you increase the concentration of this particular bacteria, you got less anxious behavior. Mm. So that's kind of like a bit of a, and it's really just scratching the surface. We know we're looking into this more, but um, you know, and, and people have mental health benefits from seeing sight, you know, sights and sounds of nature. Yeah. And maybe that's a training thing. We're used to getting some biological benefit, so we just associate this benefit with, with the green space out there. So, yeah, it's about quality of green space, biodiverse green space, soil as well. Having some sort of exposure, not, not sort of, you know, let's go and expose all our soils, that's not the answer. It's having some sort of interaction, whether it's gardening, whether it's you know, mm. occasional rotations or whatever, but it's not just plants. It's biodiverse parts and it's the soil as well. So about the soil. Yeah, once again, oh, so absolutely. We're design that into our building environments. I think we have a question on the Zoom, so um, you, uh, we can either have it. Yeah, I can read it out for you. Read it out for us, Tim. Yeah, it's a question from Hugh Kneebone. Thank um, you. How do we promote and enable regenerative solutions, given one of the biggest barriers in the dominant economic system that does not value nature, but sees it as a free resource to be exploited? Oh, big questions, Hugh. Um, we'll give it to uh, urban landscape architect and urban planner, Craig. <laughs> he seems ready for it. No, look, it's a, and as I said, when I started off, when you work in the government sector, you, you generally are at a higher level of working in strategy and how it all fits together and what we should be aiming for and how it all fits together. But when you go more into the private sector, you often come in and get the result of a lot of that stuff or what was done three years ago. And you get the project, you get engaged when you get engaged. And you might not like the decisions that have been made up until then on the project. And you can, you can attack that in a number of different ways. And you can, you can uh, retort. Uh, with passion and fire in the belly and throw a tantrum if you like, but it'll probably just get you booted off the job. And I think it, it's, a, it's a process and you have to set the example. You have to, even if you do come in the back end of a, of a really tough gig that you, you, the site has been destroyed and there's still good to be done and there's still... Uh, a process that can be undertaken. So uh, accepting responsibility. There's sometimes you probably just want to walk away and that might be the way to go where people don't want to listen, they don't want to hear. But uh, we were talking about the removing trees in the backyard. It's it's a really tough thing where if you just go, whoa, 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 
We can still do that, but we just if you push this, push that, and that's I guess asking for help. It's it's asking for opinions. It's uh, so I guess it's it's trying to use your influence for good, use your ideas for good, and with collective change and collective like groups like this, man, it spreads some uh, information, some ideas, and everyone here is going to talk to someone tomorrow or look up something else. Uh, there was a really interesting paper that came to mind. For a while, there was the TOD, which was the Transit Oriented Development, and a really smart academic in Perth. I used to live in Perth as well. Uh, Julian Bolita wrote a great paper on God, which was Green Oriented Development, and he oh. <laughs> all right he um, unpacked. So the decision making that goes into a TOD where it's all about transit and we're going to build right on the transit thing so people can just go straight to work. And uh, this one is about, well, okay, what if we don't need transport? What if people are working from home in this development? But instead of a big car park or a train station, they're looking out onto a park. Mm. What how do you make that stack up? What are the trade-offs that you have to do? So, yeah, check, check out that paper. It's very, very yeah. interesting. And I think what's, um, I, what I enjoy a lot about the conversations that we have, especially with different ASBN events, is um, you have this interplay where you do have to make decisions now, for now, in the system that you're in now. Um, but then how do you actually strategically um, uh, navigate that process to potentially kind of change that process a little bit. And Etchi, um, from what I know from like what you're doing right now in the Department of Education, you know, you already kind of alluded to it. You're trying to change that process a little bit, like you know, about like even, you know, what actually gets used or, um, uh, and, you know, where do you see opportunities to actually, you know, change the starting point for people? Um, I think the most important thing is to listen. Sometimes we yeah. we arrive to a meeting, and as designers, as um, we think we know um, what they need, and then we uh, you we always would like to start our meeting saying, "Just tell me everything you you want." That doesn't mean they'll get everything, but we try to see the possibilities in what in. Um, in regards to what the, that place needs. And then they start telling you all these things and then you start making a brainstorm in, in some regards. And sometimes they come up with some very bad ideas. <laughs> that happens. Um, but you're, yeah, but I noticed that um, you just um, come up with some questions. Some, um, sometimes, like you said, some people think about now and they can't visualize in 30 years. So usually I, um, I come up with the questions most of the meetings. What do you think about this space in 30 years? What are you going to be doing with this building in 30 years? Because when you design a building, it's going to be there for many, many years. So um, we cannot think about a building or a space or even a city for the next um, five years. It's going to be there for so many years. And the best designs were designs that were thinking ahead. So mm. we just need to be mindful that, um, especially in regards to materials as well, what are you going to be using all that space? How are you going to be recycling that in, 30, in, in 50 years? Um, what is the priority of your project? Is that... Um, is that to be the most beautiful project or is, or is more important to invest some? Um, maybe on the beginning it will be a bit more uh, cost, uh, cost to invest some um, rainwater tanks or um, solar panels. But how is going, how these little things, these little changes is going to affect um, the space and the project in many, many years time. So it's so interesting because after you, you do that, um, could you imagine you on this space in 30 years, in 20 years, and then they come back to you with completely different ideas. So you, sometimes you don't even need to influence their thinking. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of, uh, you brought up a, uh, Craig and also Etchi brought up some really fantastic points because, um, you know, like, 
like the built environments, yes, they aren't forever, but then they actually shape a lot of things. And the same thing with policy, correct? And we were already talking about policy and stuff like that. So kind of trying to like wrap that up for, for Hugh, Hugh's question. You know, if we're, we're, if we're a society based on extraction, there's a lot of opportunities where we can actually rethink. It's like, okay, well, yes, it might be based on extraction. However, what's, what's, what's actually pushing that extraction is the pursuit of happiness, quality of life, and all these other kind of things. But what we're actually talking about is that that pursuit of happiness through extraction um, is false. Um, and we might actually have to rethink that a little bit and think a little bit longer term. Um, and, and you're talking about buildings lasting 30 years. I want to shout out uh, the brother, uh, Daniel Langenberg, back there, because he was talking about, I remember him at a panel session where he's like, yeah, I, used to, uh, I was an urban planner and stuff like that. And what I learned was that you know, buildings might be, you know, 30, 50 years, but roads are like forever. <laughs> so like infrastructure even takes that out even longer, right? And um, yeah, if we set our roads in the wrong orientation, how many, how many, um, how many homes have, or like even buildings have we actually put on the wrong foot? Um, uh, so do we have another question from the, from the audience here? Because if you don't, I'm going straight to Zoom. All right, Zoom, do we have another question? We have plenty. Plenty. Um, got a specific one from Steve Fuller. Thank there you, Steve. There are lots of Adelaide Dunes groups utilizing this public space as a focus of care, interaction, and activism. Um, however, parks and verges are highly managed and regulated by councils that are not engaging with local communities around these spaces. Does the panel have a view about the role and function of these spaces for the benefit of people, biodiversity, and how to protect them and promote direct community engagement for the care of these spaces? Can we actually bring you in, Craig, on, on that one? Um, and then I'd like your perspective as well, Phil, because you've interacted in this space a lot. Look, the verge is, is public space, and I guess when you don't have a park down the road uh, or you are living in a, an urban environment, then the verge is a space where people intersect, where people meet. Uh, you may have a street tree. And look, most most local councils in metro areas have a verge policy where you can pretty much do what you want as long as you're not planting weeds or whatever. But there's wonderful examples of where the notion of a, of a road and a verge is, is pushed to the limit, where they become corridors. And verges are places where... Um, swales and drainage occurs, so things like permeability and, and uh, having permeable surfaces and uh, verges are where you have soil, where uh, you can grow things, so um, often service providers are putting every telecommunication cable they can in there, which in makes it way more expensive to plant trees or not plant trees at all. You've got water services, you've got all these things that all go in this one metre mm. <laughs> between the footpath and the kerb. So that's where I guess the decision 20 years ago to make a common service trench in a location that still enables you to plant that tree, that's where that bit of thinking and that bit of planning can make that verge a pretty amazing one metre uh, along that street. So I think planning is so important in that space and thinking about what functions it can perform, what is the context, who who's can, can use that space, whether it's birds, um, and, and, and things in the soil. Yeah, and can, can we just hand it over to you, Phil? And this is kind of where I want to actually bring in a little bit more. I know we've already went through a little bit of examples of, you know, how do we how do we actually in enable regenerative design, and what are some probably some like I, um, uh, things that you've seen or worked on. But you know, in terms of the streetscape, you know, one planet living kind of like communities. There's probably some fantastic kind of activation that actually happens and could you shed some light on that whether it's in South Australia or abroad yeah so it's really interesting when you when and if you have a look at the one planet living it has 10 principles that talks about culture community sustainable food um, health and happiness all the way down to zero carbon sustainable water um, and one of the things that it encourages is you know you make edible um, streetscapes as part of that. And it's, and it's interesting how when you start to have that conversation with councils in South Australia, it's the risk. What's the risk to the public? How do we control the fruit? How do we control 
you know, all the other things that might come along with fruit that are in a public good. And um, uh, so I, so in, in terms of that, there's, there's a, a change in, con, uh, in, in the way that people think about these public spaces, these verges. And I would encourage and uh, guerrilla activism in the urban environment. And I'll give my own example of this. So um, I had a compost bin out the back, so I throw all my stuff in the compost bin. I then took my, all my compost out into the, the verge and just put it in there as soil. And I planted a couple of plants and then I just let whatever was there grow. So I now have this uh, great tomato plant that is continuing to grow without water, without hardly any water except the rain that falls. Um, and it's going better than my backyard tomatoes because uh, it gets more sun. It's got to be frustrating as hell. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. But, but what's, in, what's um, important is that that soil has started to create a bind and it sits over the top of things like telecommunications, cables and everything else that sits underneath the verges. And I think, you know, what, there's this point that goes that we can over-plan and over, um, uh, and over engineer our, our urban environment. And we have to leave space for these, little, what I could call these little gems of, of urban guerrillaism that actually make things better for people. So mm. going back to Stephen's question, you know, and, and this is probably not the answer you're looking for, but I, I really think that, you know, when we empower people in communities, um, which is part of the One Planet Living journey, um, the surprising things happen, you know. Um, people will take control of their space. Um, they'll block a road and they'll create a play space for kids, you know. There's classic examples in New York where they've done that, um, where they've blocked off streets for kids to play because there's no play space. Um, and I think, you know, that they're the kind of things that we can do. We can create bike... There's a great um, argument in Adelaide at the moment around the, the east... Is it the east-west bike way that's being... You know, we're spending... A lot of money on it, um, and it's been really well set up. Um, we could have just, you know, we could have done that with, uh, you know, wine barrels all, all down the road, mm. you know, or something like that at a cheaper price, but to get the effect that we need, and it wouldn't have taken so long. So yeah. I think there's opportunities. Mm. Going back to a question, talk about opportunities. We, we just have to have a little bit of life to be able to do it and and you know, get out there. Yeah, be a gorilla. Yeah, and could I bring the rest of the panel in? Because the, the reality of this is that we got to wrap up this conversation. But, um, uh, but you know, how how do you see this actually? You know, like, what are the, what are the opportunities? Like, how do we make it this all happen? I just wanted to touch on that question yeah, of the yeah. public the public spaces and the and the parks. Our, our group has um, studied the bacteria and the fungi from you know sports ovals, the the, the ground and in the air. We compare that to community gardens and, and parks, and they're different. There's different bacteria, different fungi. And so if our system is used to, from an evolutionary point of view, if we're used to the fungi, the bacteria that are more similar to the natural spaces, we're getting something different now. So, mm. yep. Yeah. Um, well, we've talked about roads and public space, and so I'm really keen for us to consider the inequity of roads for cars and how difficult it is for us to advocate for bike infrastructure or walking infrastructure where you've got a road that's got a ridiculous amount of, of um, fast-moving vehicles on it and you've got um, bikes and people just sharing just such a, a tiny bit of that space. And um, I think that's, a, that's something we really need to start talking about more is the, is the inequity of, of road infrastructure. Uh, inequity of a lot of different infrastructure, right? Yeah. Um, the inequity of access to nature, the inequity of access to even healthy air, um, clean water. Um, it's it's uh, we're probably a lot very, very fortunate um, here in South Australia for sure, um, but doesn't mean that we have uh, the different problems that we need to tackle as well. Um, but even globally. There's a lot of things that um, infrastructure, built environment, um, all that kind of stuff really needs to address. So um, now, because, because we do have to wrap this up, um, and I really appreciate the conversation that we've had, and I hope you all have been having an enjoyable uh, time kind of uh, consuming these kind of thoughts and also to, to Zoom. Um, but I cannot leave, let the panel leave without at least a, ref, uh, a reflection on our own
kind of discussion that we just had, and um, maybe some key takeaways that you kind of feel. Um, so I was wondering if uh, we can actually get that mic back down to Etchy and kind of just go down the go down the road here. No, row, not the road. <laughs> Infrastructure. Um, go down the row here, and um, you know, for for yourself, um, what maybe just like a sentence or two. Because if you guys keep going for like five minutes, I'm be like ah, <laughs> right? Quick, quick kind of reflection upon what uh, what how do we like how do we pursue a regenerative future, um, and specifically through your sphere of influence, like where um, you work, where you live. In my perspective, I think um, we need to work collaborative. It's without collaboration that's not going to happen. So I think government, um, designers, scientists, everyone, um, we are so smart and so creative. So we just need to get together and make things happen. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Echi. Uh, Dr. Craig? Going back to the, the COVID uh, scenario there, I think people have seen the opportunity of spending more time or less time traveling, commuting, and, and appreciating getting out in nature, um, but also to have properly designed spaces in the future, it is about um, raising awareness and um, it's just, there's just definitely a social aspect to it and a policy sort of side of things. So, yeah, and that's for you guys to influence, I guess. All right. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Craig? Um, I'm not sure I've got about seven things that I want to sum up, so I'm just going to say them. I think got to do the work you've got to have the evidence when you are putting forward an idea so um, my favorite thing to say is you've got to do the work um, I think you've also COVID has also made people act very locally so I think um, design the city design the street design the place that you want not the one you get and it's it it's you have more power to say I would prefer to work from home I'm going to design my life around doing that and uh, I will come in two days a week. So you then change your life, your surrounds, you put more plants in your office, you are looking after your, your own mental health rather than the boss saying, yeah, you'll be here until 7.30 tonight and you'll be back in 8.30 tomorrow. You, are, you can still do the same amount of work, you can still do the same job. So I think having more influence over your space, your life, how you think your own mental health, I think people have taken charge of that. Awesome. Thanks, Craig. Trish? I would say on a place, on whatever project you're working on, look at the deep time ecological and cultural essence of the place. The stories exist, place exists as we, as we know, and um, uh, we're all in, in um, the position to advocate uh, for honouring that. It's when we don't honour that that it's not sustainable, it's certainly not regenerative. Indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, so, three things. Um, oh, one, three, Phil. Yeah. Be really it's quick. okay, Craig has seven. You yeah. can do it quickly. <laughs> so, one thing is uh, I'd like to encourage people to understand and, and look at One Planet Living as a, as a way of, of a future. Um, and it, it's an empowering process that, that starts to bring in some of the concepts that we've talked about tonight. So, as a Chief Executive by region, it would be remiss of me not to actually say that. Um, <laughs> secondly, I think there's, uh, there's an issue around that people have talked about, which is around listening, collaborative behaviours, um, uh, respecting place. So this issue of respect, I think, is important. So respecting the past, respecting what our role is as stewards of the future, um, respecting the, the people that um, ha, uh, come after us, so the, you know, the children and, the, and our grandchildren. Um, and, and I think part of that is respecting the connection that we need with nature in order for our bodies and, and our own health and our own lives to be rich. Indeed. And um, with, with that, it's, I'm extremely appreciative of the conversations that we had today because um, I think, personally for myself, I think the one thing that's always missing is that um, just the, the depth of how regeneration also opens up opportunities for more just futures, more empathetic futures, um, and things where we, uh, you know, on that thing around um, uh, just more care. Because I think if we're able to inject a lot more care 
and that just might be my personality type. Uh, uh, I didn't know this was going to be a psychological session at the end. But um, that, that level of care is what we can potentially bring through not only professional lives, um, through our policies, but hopefully through our individual actions as well. Um, and uh, I really appreciate just how much you have reinforced, uh, you all that have reinforced that it's not just the technical information here, it's the process of how we get to that, those bits and pieces. Um, how do we go about uh, connecting to each other, listening to each other, developing into emotional intelligence. All goes together like a circular economy. Hey, where's my where's my drum? Bow, oh. And on that note, I would just like to say, could you please join me in thanking our fantastic panel tonight?